guys, welcome back to the Purpose Podcast, where we talk about all the reasons why we do the jobs we do every single day. Following a lot of the chats I've had with different tech professionals over the last year, a lot of people are coming to me saying they're lost, they're not too sure they want to go next. Uh, so to speak, lacking that direction. And it all evolves around this concept of purpose that we talk about every day in 2021. And um, I'm so thankful to be joined by Reese Powell this week to share all the reasons why he does the job he does, uh, currently working for the head of, as the head of the platform for MVF and has been so kind to join me on this week's episode. So without taking too much from the horses now, Pete, I'm going to throw it over to Reese and find out all the reasons why he does the job he does. And again, Reese, thank you so much for coming on. How have you been and what's been going on in your world? Uh, uh, all good, thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, it's all good, yeah. Very excited. Kind of new job, as you said, head of platform for MVF Globe. Um, helping them build out their platform and the team and, and growing the business there. So, How's that going so far? How has it been on your end at the moment? It's been quite a, as busy. intensive or has it been pretty straightforward so far? Uh, busy, lots of staff. <laughs> Uh, you know, the, it, it's an organization, a business that's grown over the years uh, and is, is looking to stabilize and move forward. So there's a lot of stuff that, that two engineers just didn't have the time to do. So I'm there to, to be that umbrella to stop them having to go to meetings and face all the political staff while also growing the team so that we can speed stuff up. So it's interesting, lots of interesting things to do, lots of interesting decisions to make plenty of stuff to move forward on and certainly no shortage of work sounds like you've got an exciting an exciting year ahead so to speak at least if not two more than likely <laughs> three at the rate it's going yeah it's one of these things we're, we're taking anything new on there's there's a lot of like unknowns isn't there you just never know what's what how it's going to go where it's going to look what's the what what challenges you're going to face and it's it's both can be quite unknown, but also quite exciting at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. My, my big thing, yeah. so I've, I've worked from second person through the door, third person through the door in a startup up to previous role to this was a 500,000 plus organization. Uh, and they're all different. They all have their problems and things like this. One of the things with moving into a, a, a scale up, as I'll call it, it's a, it's a little bit more than X. It's been a bit more steady. Is this how much chaos is there? How how bad is it underneath the the calm exterior? And and one of the I, I kind of like that excitement. It's a bit more difficult for me these days. Married with children, as opposed to when I was younger, where. Mm -hmm. said startup where I was third one in I got called in on a Sunday and left on a Thursday kind of thing because it was that important to get it out the door now with wife and child is the balance the cool thing is is that I've gone in and everybody was calm and happy because it is calm and happy in there but there's obviously this level of we know we need to fix this we know we need to yeah. fix that we know we need to do this mm -hmm. and I've, I'm, I'm lucky I'm there kind of as the orchestrator not too mm -hmm. much the doer these days, which I miss a bit, but I still get to see all the cool tech that we can play with and stuff like that. So that, that's quite exciting. And do you find, so we've obviously not so much hands on now with the role you're playing going forwards. Do you, it's, there must be still the opportunity to have a play with the new tech and seeing what comes up, seeing what the team can produce and being quite involved in that sense. Or is it, so where, where are you playing going forwards? Uh, I'm trying to get in there get deep and dirty i still uh, what i i i've personally struggled with this how much uh as a as as a people manager mm -hmm. can i spend hands on and it, and it's a very difficult thing because you don't want to get too involved simply because of the fact i've got to trust my engineers i know you know and <sighs> there's this i've got two seniors who are phenomenal engineers far better than i am i'll be honest out there churning out the work. And, and I don't want to appear to be leaning over their shoulder, checking what they're doing and things like that. But I also want to get involved in there because just as they're excited about it, I'm excited. So I'm trying to, to find a balance of how much involvement do I have. And at the moment, it's very kind of high level that I've sat, it, the, the old contractor's philosophy of I've sat in a room with somebody who's mentioned it, I've looked at the screen, that means I know how it works kind of. Mm -hmm level of knowledge i've got in there the the big thing is that obviously they have holidays and we're going through that at the moment so there's times where it's a case of something is broken 
and other things right as you know slightly late this morning due to an outreach meeting but you know it means that I'm suddenly flung into the, I don't know how this works, but I've got to get it working immediately. So there's that fun and excitement, and, and I'm quite enjoying that, which I haven't had for a while. The unknowns as well. Like, that's what we said, like the unknowns. You just don't know what's around the corner, do we? It's just that it changes. Absolutely. It's one of those exciting things about, in a way, hindsight. Hindsight's a really brilliant thing because you just never know, right? And yep. with, with all the work, you're obviously with the senior engineers you're working with and going through the process of building your team at the moment. Um, there's obviously a push or a motivator there as, as a people manager to help people grow, help people you know go to that next place where they're looking to go next. And there's obviously some motivators in the jobs that we all do every day. And so what really pushes you to help others? What's that real motivator look like for you? So there's, there's two, two things. My previous role was originally taken on specifically to create a training program to, to take on graduates and train them up in the ways of working in in DevOps and understand modern IT delivery. And that's still an element of this because we've got two kind of mid and junior team members coming along. And that's my big thing is, is I had so much fun in my early IT career that, like I said, going in on a Sunday and coming out on a Thursday was cool because I was learning so much and I was absorbing all of this and I was fighting problems and fixing issues and, 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 getting so excited about what I was doing and I want to try and help people at, at the start of their career journey to get some of that excitement and some of that fun mm -hmm. that that I did but what I also realized is and hence part of the, the the recent job move is that while doing that and while I was having all of that fun actually what I was trying to do was to help a business and, and the business has now gone on and it's pivoted a few times but is a successful financially stable business I helped move that business forward to do bigger and better things and keep going and their initial you know their initial financing their funding set them off down a path that that they've been able to grow upon so we're now implying or it's it's now implying i think about 40 50 people is successful so i had loads of fun i want people to have the same kind of fun as i had but also now moving back to where i am is i want to see this business grow and flourish and and achieve the the well, I don't think they're lofty. I think the business does the the, the 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 vision that they have for the future and try and get them there and say, yeah, I helped contribute towards that. Amazing. And with with the with those those motivators that you go out there to to help people to to get to that next place and watch it grow and have a um, a degree of autonomy in a way to to help that business grow, whatever that shape or form looks like. And do you find that when you're when you're going out and helping people, you must be faced with, I'd say, blockers uh, that, that come across in the work you do every day. And it could be blockers from people, uh, blockers to getting somewhere with an objective in the business. It can come in multiple shapes and forms and, and personally too. So is there any, any like blockers that you notice when you go out talking to people and, and looking to help them with a, a problem they're facing? What, do you ever see that? Quite, is that quite a common factor that you come across? Yeah, so, so many of them. Um, for a lot of, I'll, I'll take the personal level first. For, for a lot of people, there's this belief that they need to know X, Y, and Z before they can commit to mm. something. Mm -hmm. um, job, you know, the, the, the previous engineers, there were some of them like, I don't know what I want to do because I want to do this, but that means I need to know all of this beforehand. The reality is you don't. Um, the vast majority of technology that I've played with recently, I don't have a clue about because, mm -hmm. number one, I'm not particularly a developer. And mm -hmm. there's all these people throwing things like Next.js at me and, and you know, TypeScript. And, and, and I'm just like, mm, you can make your infrastructure mm -hmm. sing, but I don't know. But I'm heavily involved with, with developers. Mm -hmm. It's about getting, you know, realizing that if you've got a good foundation in technology and you've worked on that, that you can then apply that to grow and, and do, the, do the right thing. So I see a lot of people get blocked personally by that. And then for organizations, they're very heavily into the, but this is how we've always done it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so 
have you not looked out the window? Have you not looked at the internet? You know, the world has moved on in the past. Yeah. COVID is, is a huge example of how the whole of society has changed. You know, you look at now the amount of money, time and effort that was poured into businesses that said we will never have an online presence having to sell everything online mm -hmm. and the world is moving all the time you can't sit back and say but you know but it works for us now it's like yeah great but you might find there's a tool out there or there's a process out there or there's a completely different way of thinking that will make your lives easier and mm -hmm. i don't go into work to work hard i go into work to do as little as possible to be brutally <laughs> fair <laughs> by optimizing all of the tricks that are available to me and if that means changing processes improving things you know i'm i come from the, the old school uh i'm a good sysadmin if i've made myself redundant because everything is automated it just runs around me and that kind yeah. of stuff and and you should be aiming to to reduce the amount of reliability on people not because you can then get rid of people, but people can do the thought stuff that will actually yeah. help your business. Yeah, yeah, it's so true. It's, it's it takes away that element of going from if you get everything in place and all the processes in place that allow the business to get to where, say, the MD or the, the founders, whoever it may look like, get it to a point when they go, okay, we we're here and we want to go there. Let's get it to there, and then rework the roles of the people that we've got in the team to we've got value out of them there there must be somewhere else we can gain value from their skill set right and it just it's a very good way of looking at it though, because it just allows you to think a bit differently about mm -hmm. you see things in a different way and like you say if you get your roles in place to, to solve a problem and it might take time to solve that problem but once it's there, does that mean your role is redundant or does it develop and does it change? Does it evolve? What, is, what does it look like? And like we said about the hindsight and the unknown is that we just don't know what that can look like, do we? And it's, it, that's the, the curiosity of the future, isn't it? Absolutely. And, and you know, as a person, you've got to remember that you need to move with the business as well. You can't say, but this is what my job is. But, and there are a lot of people I know who love going into work and doing exactly the same thing on exactly the same spreadsheet and fair play to them. Maybe that's what they they, they want to yeah. do. But I, I think people that are going to drive your business forward would much rather get rid of that, get that automated because they're the ones that are going to bring you new avenues that you never even thought about as the business owner, as the manager or whatever, because now they've got time and space to breathe, mm -hmm. to go if we do this, we could make more money. Or if we do this, we could bring on this extra product line or we could, you know, introduce our, we, we could go global or whatever. And there's definitely an element of that allowing employees to grow, which I've seen some businesses are completely adverse to that. There's this, you know, the, the meme that goes around, you know, so-and-so wants to get trained in this, but if I train him, I know he'll leave. The reality is that, but if you don't, he'll leave anyway. And I'd much rather have an intelligent person who loves to to get the training and grow and improve because they're going to find other paths to move the business forward. Do you feel in your experience of working with people like that, because it does happen, do you ever find that there's a noticeable moment when that person is ready to move on? Do you Can you... Do you find it easy to, this is kind of the brush way of saying it, but um, do you ever find it's easy to identify when you can tell that somebody will leave sooner or later? Does that, does that come across to you quite obviously? There's, uh, I wouldn't say that there's a time that, you, that I've seen where somebody will leave sooner or later. I've seen when people should leave. Uh, and there's a definite time, and and I personally, through numerous jobs, and I recognise it far earlier now. There's a point in time that comes where I need to look for a new role. My behaviour, my mindset, and everything does change. And I think that is very obvious in 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 a, in a lot of people. Um, as for 
the knowing that somebody is going to leave that's a very difficult thing depending and we're back to this we don't know the future the growth of the company the way the company's going to change i personally feel that at certain levels there is a certain period of time somebody brings value to a company unless things are changing quite dramatically you know you you have a lifespan of your ideas your knowledge your experience can come in and help a business grow help a business move forward but unless then there's a a movement for them within the organization or there is further growth and big change within the organization actually Mm. they've run out of fresh fresh ideas they've, they've given their contribution and they themselves you would hope would reflect actually i've done all i can here maybe it's time for me to go and look for something else that's more interesting for me will progress my career will help me move forward because i'll be doing a favor to the business in the end because they can get somebody else in with fresh ideas to loop over to continue the growth to continue the change Mm. and it's it's really difficult to like you say i completely agree It's, it's very hard to sit there and say what that looks like because uh, there's there's so many like external or the personal variable that you mentioned earlier on in someone's life that can have a massive impact on the way someone go approaches the, the job they do every single day and I think that can really change someone's mindset towards something for me particularly it's like when I when I'm I can feel myself in a in a mindset that isn't particularly aligned with what I'm doing it's I can feel my there's there's, there's a certain persona that I I can sometimes give off that kind of creates this out of this this perception that you know I, I may need to find something different that can allow me to to grow and change into something quite different and it's it's really really challenging to sit there and say when that is but there's there's that famous saying of you never know when the right time is would you agree absolutely absolutely this is my second career as well so you know i've been i i i started and the wife and I were having a conversation because my boy is just coming up five. So he starts school next week, 2nd of September. And it made me realize that it was exactly the same day 30 years ago that I started working. So I went straight from school, straight in to, to doing an apprenticeship. And I did that for 10 years. So I was a mechanical manufacturing engineering specialist in assembly lines, never actually worked on assembly lines, ended up working heat treatment, plating, processing, machining, all of that kind of stuff. Well, I had that as a career for, for 10 years and then changed to uh, to IT because it just felt mm-hmm. within engineering. And I'd moved around the jobs a lot there. You know, engineering moves at, you know, what what we do and how IT changes in a week is, is about five years worth of change in engineering. The most exciting yearly change is that somebody will come up with, look, we've got a different coating on our tool tip which means it'll last for another hundred cuts really exciting um so i moved into it and i am already in the realms of Mm. because i've I've been here 20 years plus now thinking about the next stage and that's very much you know the the, so i've read somewhere many years ago that apparently you have three careers in your life so i think i'm about due to move on to my third at some point but you have multiple careers within your career and and you need to be aware of this and you need to kind of mm-hmm. realize that you will. As great as a company is, there comes a point where you feel, am I giving them everything? Are they giving me everything? And, and I think we work for an awful lot of our lives. One of the crucial things I've realized, and it took a move earlier in my IT career, was that actually an organization has to give me as much as i give them i'm not there just to to give they have to return that in some way or another and that can come in multiple forms as well can't it you just it's it really is difficult it's what you what you give is what you what you put in is what you get out isn't it it's very much uh it's a two-way street isn't it and if it's not reflective of that i feel like you can find just people can find themselves in a situation where they're saying actually is this right for me should i should i be considering something that's more aligned with where i want to go and, yeah. and and pursuing something that might be more appropriate for the time and place that someone's at and it's it takes a bit of 
selfishness, doesn't it? To to sit there and say, I need to look out for, you've got to look out for number one, you've got to put your gas mask on first. And doing that for some people, I think I'm, I'm, I'm also uh, a victim to it, is that you can, I, I'm quite a nice person, I'd like to think I come across quite a, uh, a friendly, friendly and approachable person. And that can put me in a position where I'm sometimes in a, it's, it's hard to know when the right time is, I suppose. It's, it's hard to sit there and say, what's, what's next? What's that going to look like? What's an exit plan? Those sort of questions that come up, right? And it's, it is, it's knowing in yourself, isn't it? Would you agree? Uh, yeah. And I'm going I'm to say this. As men, we're typically bad at it as well. Mm. It, it's, it's very weird. I've had uh, a lot of female colleagues who are very clear. And it's not all men. But there's the, most of us are just like, oh, but they're a good company, or but it's okay, it's easier. I know what I'm doing. And we'll 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 kind of hide. Where a lot of my female colleagues are just like, no, this is not right for me now, and th- th- they'll go off and, and, and sort it out. So, but but there's that definitely, it, it, you need to be comfortable with yourself and who you are to realize what you're feeling and what you're thinking within an organization, and within the role within the organization because it might not necessarily just be the organization um and it's very easy to hide it as well yeah you live in london i used to live in london as we all know it might not be the same now but certainly pre-covid it's it's a very work hard party hard kind of place so you can ignore the fact that you don't particularly like the job because you like your colleagues and going out every night having yeah, one or ten bevies. You know, you, you think you're enjoying work life, and and you need to reflect on that. But then, you know, there's, there's also sometimes you do have to make compromises. Um, I, I'd love to just disappear off and do a bit of leather work and build cars for a living. But unfortunately, I have to pay the mortgage. I have to feed children because apparently they require food to keep growing <laughs> and stuff. Uh, so uh, you know you, you have to be aware that sometimes compromises do need to be made mm-hmm. but are you still moving in the general path of, of where you want to be and does your current role still fit your current philosophy of life and things like that yeah this is a lot a lot of people uh, this is this is i think this is the one thing that i've come to terms with more is in working in the recruitment space is that there is this that previously an emotional disconnect between the recruiter and the uh, candidate, so to speak, because it's a lot of people, even me myself, don't realize how much goes into finding that next job because it can literally be the next five, 10 years of your life, potentially 15 years of your life at that company. And that's a massive, absolutely massive commitment to, to you know, to your life really, because that's a, that's a sizable amount of time in your adult life that you will spend in that business um, doing multiple different, you know, do, you can watch a business change on a dime if you've been in it for that long. And it's, it's very rare to find that now as well. Um, and it, I noticed and sat there was that the emotional side, both personally and, and from a development point of view, if it's not aligned with where you want to go, there's this, there's this effect that can happen in the recruitment side of it where it's just like, oh no, this is great. And there's like a level of persuasion that's created. And it's that's that's in a way that's that's kind of wrong because you you can really that if you think that it's right for them, but you don't know all their individual circumstances, you don't know what they're going through, you don't know, you you know them for a piece of paper that they sent you that you passed on to a client. They went through a process and they like the job, you like them, and that that's this is it's very there's a transactional element there but you don't know all the the parts behind that individual and i think that's where there's a massive disconnect between but in in the process it's it's, there's a there's an element there that again people don't always want to share things as well they don't want to share what's what's going on in the background they don't want to uh they want they want this they want to disclose that information just because they can and um, I, I, I don't know about yourself, have you ever found it in that situation where, from experiences that you've had? The, so you're going to love this. I have an affectionate term for most recruiters, pimp, mm. uh, simply because 
I, I will say the industry has changed hugely. People like yourself and, and a few of the other recruitment agencies have sussed this, that we are not just a piece of meat mm -hmm. to be sold out to the highest bidder. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've been very, you know, it, and you still see it, you, you, you get people turn up and say, oh, you'll love this job and it pays this money and it does all this and it does all that. And it's like, and then they'll kind of let you know, but actually you'll end up working 13, 14 hours a day. Uh, they, they, they neglect that. And it's like, but I've got a family. I've got to stick the kids to bed and things like that. I, I'm definitely, there is the emotional side of recruitment is coming through in recruitment agencies these days. And it's, it's a, finally a pleasure to see that people are considering that because I, I kind of look back at the my early days in IT where I, I, you, you didn't get into finance, so you ended up in recruitment and it was all about sell, 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 not about is this the correct path for this person to move forward. And that's definitely changed. But I actually think that organizations themselves and people themselves are becoming far more um, aware that it's not you, you, it's not like our our parents' days where you just went into work, you were a drone, you sat there for 10 hours a day, you processed down the assembly line. That actually they, there needs to be some emotional attachment to your role these days. Otherwise, you might just as well be a machine. Yeah, it's very, very true. It's very, very true. You, you can literally find yourself in a situation where it's it just becomes numbers. It just becomes like you like you say. There's, there's agencies have come to this point now. Not every agency, you know. There's there's now nearly forty two thousand agencies in the UK that are operating, and it's it, like of those, how many of those have clocked on and gone? Actually, we need to do things a little bit differently. Um, I, I can sit here and put my hand up and say there's very few. And it's it, it, I, I, I'm optimistic that it's those agencies that will be able to buck the trend, hopefully at some point. It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take a number of years to do it, but buck the trend of, no, there's a better way to, to work. There's a better way to operate. It's, you know, it's not, it's, we're, not, we're not living 20 years ago when it was a completely different industry, completely different environment. And I think we're, we're approaching a very interesting period of, of the time where I think it will change again. I, I'm not. There's a hundred ways to to approach a situation, but there's going to be stories of situations where the horror stories and all. The, I think that's going to continue, and there's there's going to be some stigmas that are in the air. Um, it's all over the world. Recruitment happens all over the world, and it happens in so many different ways. And everyone as an individual is different, so it's 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 really really hard to to find that. That say so that agency that you can confine in and go to every single time and say you know what I want to work with you again because of X Y Z and that's that's where it's going to be incredibly tricky I think and it's yeah how that was going to look I, I don't know I think it's also to do with the industry as well because obviously working in IT there is a shortage of people. Everyone, you, you, you have these differing things. No, there's not a shortage of people. It's just the way you interview people or your expectations. And that's not quite true because you can't always hire grads in because the reality is, and, and I'm going to call this out now, if you think you can hire a grad in and they can do IT, you're going to be very shocked because most of the universities do not teach anybody anything relevant to the IT industry. Um, so, so there is some kind of shortage, but I think that has forced a change in the way that we're recruited within the industry because you want to get the best for your clients. So you're going to make sure that the person that fits is yeah. going to be right and you're going to have the conversations. And I think that is going to cascade down into other industries we, we hear, you know, there's, there's a shortage of drivers for, for trucks and stuff like that. And, you know, we might get self-driving trucks, but that's still, if we're going to be brutally honest, 10 so many years away, what, are we going yeah. to carry on in a shortage? No, you're going to have to treat the people who work in that industry mm -hmm. with the respect they deserve and, and so on and so forth. And I, I can see that expanding out 
just as the IT recruiters have found, it's going to have to be in, in other industries as well, simply due to people won't put up with it, they'll all go off. You know, more statistics I saw, gen whatever it is, people who've left university in the past kind of five to 10 years are far more comfortable going, no, nope, I'm just going to do what I want, make a little bit of money, just so long as I can pay the rent at the end of the day. And they're not going to be forced into the factory mentality and they're not going to be pushed around mm. um, like they were because, yeah. you know, got to have a big job that pays well and so on and so forth. But the, the, there's definitely a decline of that in this country as far as I can see. Yeah, and it's, it's, uh, it's going to be increasingly difficult to find workers who are willing to... I think especially with the, the, the trend of instant gratification and, you know, just having access, I would grab my phone, but uh, the access to just pick up your phone, check, you know, Instagram, Facebook, uh, just any social media platform and just sit there and just binge. It's, it's, it really frightens the life out of me how, how that's become an increasing trend. And obviously, I, I, on the note of schools, because I know you said uh, your young, your, your one of your children's going to school next week, like that. Um, even that alone, it's quite a. By the age of, I think it's by the age of eight or nine now, the statistics show that about seventy-five percent of young uh, young children in that age category of eight onwards now have a mobile phone, and that just blows my mind. It's like I remember the day I, when my first one was a Nokia three ten. Uh, it was. Um, it was you know that was that was what it was back in the day and it's even even before that it's it's changed so much i didn't get my first phone so i was at least 13 14 and it's it's changed so much that it's i mean that the school schools gonna have the same problem that universities are having you have people on their phones not engaging with content and just just being numbed really to the to, to the fact that they've got this this little phone in front of them that's got like 101 things going on all the time and it's just bombarding them with information and that i think is going to be one of the harder realities that people are going to have to face going forward into this next decade i think it's it's interesting though because i don't particularly like the education system in this country uh prime example like i said i, I was hiring graduates and the reality is they had no idea yeah. Have you ever worked with infrastructure? No. So you wrote code, yes. How did that code run? Well, I'd send them a zip file. Congratulations. So you never used anything that, that version controlled your code. You have no idea then how to compile, run it, deploy it on a server to see it. Or so, you know, I, and this is a university. These are people coming in with master's degrees and stuff like that. And you just, some of them had a bit of knowledge because of personal learning, but the reality, they're paying thousands of pounds a year for nothing. And our education system still fits that old mentality that we just talked about, that people are going to leave school at certain levels. They're either going to be a manager or they're going to be a drone sat there processing bits, building bits. We're not allowing children, let's teach them reading, mm -hmm. let's teach them maths, let's teach them how to use computers, but then let's spend an awful lot of time allowing them to explore and grow and and find their little niche in life the thing that makes them excited so if we carry on our education system i honestly believe that what you've just called out is going to be a huge huge problem but if we can take this short termism and and if you have a look at it most people think oh, i can be an influencer which means they they, they, they they're going to be creative is that we should be driving far more of the learning about creativity through the education system because i think if you do that what you will do is people will find the thing that they want to do and then the rest of the complex learning kind of comes comes with it you know generally how i've got on in my life is because there's been a problem i've needed to solve and, and education hasn't education didn't teach me how to problem solve number one um, and normally to fix that problem, there's certainly no subject in school that would ever help you do that. So I've had to go out and understand the problem and then learn how to fix the problem, which meant learning mm -hmm. new technologies and, and, mm -hmm. and things like that. You know, I have a life full of craziness around me, a 3D print, crochet, mm -hmm. DJ, 
and that's all driving this you know it's, it's all driving because i have this oh i feel like doing that kind of stuff and i think we suppress a lot of that there's also a lot of room yeah there's also a lot of room to to develop in areas outside and i think the one thing that really does stand out for people is that they go into school and they sat there and you go to your desk and it's just like today we've got maths english history uh geography and um, drama, just as an example. And you have, it's, you're bombarded with so many different subjects. And then when only you get to, I think it's, it, I can't the education square, it's changed quite a lot since I went through it now. And that, I think it gets to now year nine and, or, or grade four for, for the US watchers, um, where you start to specialize in a certain subject and they, even then you you're still refined to specific subjects because they don't have all the specialists in certain areas some schools didn't teach so i went to i, I studied international relations and politics at university but it wasn't until i went to university when i studied international relations and politics it was it was only barely covered in history and that was like that was that was a very far-fetched approach to, to it and it was it was the self learning that I did that got me in. It wasn't the it wasn't the bits in the background. My my, my school at the time didn't have the capability to to, to to facilitate that sort of conversation and have those have have a specific tutor deliberately focus on politics. It was a real. It was only till I left and they brought it in, and I was I was blown away by the fact that that was a thing. I thought they would actually bring people in who would you know actually spend spend the time like the, but again every school's different they're trying i think they're trying to resolve a, 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 a the, the education system with a very fine silver bullet and that silver bullet doesn't exist it's just uh it's just a let's see if is that a classic example of getting a bit of tissue paper and throwing it on the ceiling and seeing if it sticks and i don't think that's going to really work for for this generation of children and i i'm i'm, I'm a little on the fence about how that's going to look going forwards. It, it's funny how you we both called out the same thing there, but I, and I think this is the silver bullet. Mm. It, you said that they didn't bring anybody in to teach you politics, and it was your self learning that mm. got you there. And and I actually think that schools don't spend enough time teaching pupils how to learn. Mm. They tell people what to know, not yes. Here's something. Go away. This is how you learn. This is you. You, you work at, and obviously we know that I mean, I've, I've spent a lot of time studying this over the years. There's a lot of different learning styles, and schools are adapting to that slightly. It freaks me out the way that my child is going to be taught. I was taught very much by the rote system, so it's like you know, times table repeated over and over. And now they they do different things, but essentially they're still not teaching people. Or children or guiding them in their way of learning so yeah. history bored me to death in school i quite like it now but that's because of the fact i can consume it via these these apps that are potentially a problem because i can find the right person that mm -hmm. connects with me and it's short enough that allows me to absorb and I, you know i'm i'm more of a visual and hands-on learner but some of my friends are very much i need to read a book mm -hmm. if i read a book then i'll understand it and i can absorb it and things like that but we don't seem we, we seem to be failing at that and all of the grads i took on were completely freaked out with me going here's the problem go fix but how what's your learning style but yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and it's like you need to grow and understand that because yeah. then you can work out how to solve problems mm -hmm. that's that's me in a nutshell like it's I, I'm, I'm a hands-on learner like i learn by by sitting me down and showing like do a show and tell like physically show me right um and like, this is why i'm quite hands-on so obviously my, my background's very very unique and uh, i'm very uh, i'm just I, I'm, I'm very much i used to be a generalist where i used to be able to do 101 different things draft jacks all trades and just no bits and like I can put something together like just my hands I was very very hands-on as a person with like different industries that I've worked in and that worked for me it was but it just got to a point where it was 
I, I realized that I needed to specialize in something that was going to get me to where I wanted to be next. And it was, it was all, all well and good having all these different skills and knowing certain things, but because you don't practice it all the time, although you've done it and you know it, you have to re, you have to keep practicing it to, to, to keep up with the, with the conversation and keep up with the craft. And that was, again, it worked for the time, but then I realized actually there needs to be an upper time where you sit down and go, actually, where do I want to go? now and where, what's that going to look at growing up on a farm really helped the handyman side of it and that that was great but um when i came back to the uk it was like what was what's the next big thing and it, it was tech tech's been it's been a big conversation for 10 15 years now anyway but now it's really started to come into it, it as, as i think we briefly discussed it yesterday it's like it's coming to its teenage years where it's starting to sort itself out it's starting to see where it wants to go, what it looks like, you know, if it's if it wants to be, you know, it's getting its personality, isn't it? It's starting to really show its its true form, and I think the next ten years is really going to allow the technology sector to to grow into something that it doesn't really know itself yet. I, I think we're we're on a we're on a tentative moment as to where that's going to going to look. Nobody really knows, do they? Right now, it's quite a exciting time. It, it's changed massively. Mm. since I started it but you know you, you called out there being a generalist and wanting to specialize the, the, the mm. thing is though that being a generalist is a great thing because never forget the skills that you kind of learned in the past and I suspect if you hadn't been a generalist what would have happened is you might have specialized down a path gone I don't like this what do I do next but I you know and I, I generally I'm still a generalist I <laughs> I, I faff around with as many things as I possibly can just because that's the way I work. But, it, you know, you're right. Tech is growing up. Tech is changing. Um, I think that at the moment we're going through another growth spurt is the best way to describe yeah. it. So, all of these random ideas and random things are happening that just don't make sense to me. It could be because I'm an old fuddy duddy these days, but I'm just like, this is bonkers. Why is why is X, Y, and Z getting so much money for what they do? Mm -hmm. Not really making anybody's life better. And I suspect we will have this for a little while and then things will disappear and we'll move yeah. on and we'll have another nice kind of growth phase. And and you can compare that to like when the web came online and how how much tech has changed since then and all the good stuff that it's actually brought yeah and i think we've got we're going through the crazy moment we definitely the teenage moment we're, we're at that point where we're not old enough to drink but we're going out with our mates yeah. down the park smoking yeah. fags having a few beers causing chaos and i think we will move on past that in the next kind of five or so years and there'll be another huge growth in a good direction again yeah. coming up it'll be exciting just as I retire and let everybody else carry on with it. Yeah, let, let everyone else take the horse, so to speak. Yeah, yes. it's yeah. Uh, it's an interesting one because I think um, obviously working a lot in the data science, machine learning world, it's a very, it's 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 the whole industry as a whole really. It's at a very similar point. They're all they're all trying to work out what works. And I I, I said that I I think data is having a bit of a identity crisis. It's just data, data doesn't know what data really is, and it's. There's so many different avenues that have been created. There are job titles in the in the tech space that have, don't even exist yet. And in about five years, I reckon, there's going to be a whole new load of jobs that have been created to facilitate a specific need in the data science and machine learning world that is going to be not as predominantly tech needing. So you don't need to be a tech savvy individual to, to, to do the job. But you you need to have some form of passion and experience to be able to do it, and I think that is how they're going to persuade people to come into the tech sector. Um, is that they know there's a requirement, but they need to create a job that's going to allow them to take a lot of the 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 road, you know, put, not not necessarily put the tarmac on the road, but get the machinery to the road to allow them to do it. So it's the pipeline to build it really, and it takes the weight off like a data scientist. So it allows them to to put what is needed in place to, to get them to where they need to be. And they need the grunts to do it. And I think that's that's a role that is still being refined and, and changed. But I think as demand will continue to rise, 
we're just going to see just bigger shortages and more people needed. And there's going to be a mass, I can see it now, there's going to be a mass promotion for particular, mm. uh, particular jobs that are needed. And they're just going to, a lot of companies are going to fall short of the mark. That's just the, mm. the, the sad reality at the moment. You know, to take, take your analogy of the road, the, the way we move, whether we end up with hydrogen or battery powered cars, you're not going to need somebody with spanners to fix most cars in the future. What you're going to need is somebody who is fairly proficient at diagnosing bugs in code mm -hmm. because you're going to plug your laptop in and it's all run by computer and that's how you work out why brakes are not working and all of this kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And that's just a, a tiny example when you think about the entire tech industry that's going to be built around that. And that's just because I call that one out because it's a famous one. It's one everybody's talking about Tesla, you know, and there's there's four other companies that are, are out there doing cars and two that are specifically doing lorry. But if you think there's that change there, then there's loads of other stuff coming along, quantum computing coming along that we just can't understand where that's going to take us in the future mm -hmm. as well. It's amazing because you just don't, yeah, it's just kick, it's, it's like a case, a case of kicking the can down the road, isn't it, a little bit here? Because it's, there are, there's, there's more technology coming out than there are people that understand it. It's, it's like my, my dad was a matrix specialist back in 2000s, and he was what I see as the modern data, data engineer, actually. They're in that high demand because databases are completely shot, and they aren't designed for a post-COVID post world. They were designed for a pre-COVID world. And there's such demand for the internet now that there's a huge uptake in need for engineers, data engineers specifically here. And where matrix specialists were in the early 2000s, it was like, well, I can charge this day rate and you're just going to have to pay it. And because you're not going to find anyone else who can do the job. And people just said, yep, sure, here's five grand, here's, you know, here's, here's 10 grand a month. Um, and you know, even, I heard some cases where it was even higher than that and people getting paid absolutely insane amounts of money just to do the job but that is the that is the the mark like you said briefly yesterday it was just like you're you're you've got two years experience and yet you're saying your market values 80 85 grand and you're just sat there going what how, how is that how is that possible and um it's quite frankly it does it, it does baffle me as well it's just like how can you have this amount of experience and, and claims to be this just because the market demands it. It's and that person, whoever that may be in that situation right now, they'll find themselves in the situation that when they go to the market in a year or two years down the line, they will struggle to find a job that will match their current salary based on experience. I think that's going to be something that they will struggle with. And the way they will change that is by becoming a contractor and yeah, yeah go down that avenue. Yeah. Whether, whether that's the right avenue these days or not, you know, to, I bounced out the contracting and it was lots of fun. Once again, it's, this is, it, it's a life situation, to being a contractor. I was very fortunate, I think, being an infrastructure engineer, despite the fact that we're, we're kind of always hidden, we're, we're in the dark dungeon. Uh, my skill set has always been in demand, so I never really struggled as a contractor, but I know contract devs where they could go three months without a role potentially and stuff like that so you know they might move into contracting but unless their skills are really up and one of the key things i found with all of the contractors i've met their ability to learn new things is way above and beyond most people because as a contractor you get stuff thrown at you and you go yeah i know that and you have to go off and, and kind of deliver it and I, I would suggest that a lot of people with two, three years experience are just not going to be able to do that because they haven't got the foundational knowledge of fixing servers at three o'clock in the morning because the world's on fire and that kind of stuff. So yeah. it's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting. Absolutely. And on a bit of a tangent here, actually, because I've been speaking about quite a bit about tech there. Um, I, I'd love to know something a little bit different, actually. So with everything that you've in the last um, 20 years working in the, in, in the tech space in, in many different forms, you've obviously seen quite a lot of different myths that have come out of the industry. And there's there's 101 different ones. I've, I've heard quite a few, um, but I love hearing what people have to say. So if there's one myth that you could debunk, what would it be? 
uh, the the concept of there's this fine edge. There's the people that say I need to know everything before doing the job, and then there's the people that say I only need to learn one thing and I've got a job forever. Yeah, you, you just and I've worked with people that have clung on to their old ways of working, and and the problem is that it, it's not you. You've got to be fluid in the industry. There is no job for life in IT. There is no job for life anywhere. While a good skill will allow you to grow, you've got to let it grow. And I think the biggest one is that everybody Googles everything all the time. That is true. Just because you're a senior doesn't mean you don't spend most of your time Googling everything. And I suspect the more senior you become, the more you Google, (laughs) simply because there's more nonsense already sat in there that something has popped out of the back that you can go, hang on a minute, I remember this from 20 years ago. There you go, there's your answer kind of thing. So, you know, never, you never say you always need to keep growing and learning and adapting yeah absolutely absolutely and with all those learning moments there's obviously people in your life as well that have had an impact especially when you changed 20 years ago from a career because it's always always a big moment changing something done for 10 years and then jumping into something else it's it's all can always be challenging and not to say that in the years that i've been working after multiple different industries and it's, it's got to a point now where I've gone, actually, it's it's good to be in something that's actually for a, more of a long-term period, because jumping between pillar and post can really have an impact and you know, take you different avenues that you never really expected to. But when you change, there are obviously people around you that, that supported you and helped you through it and have helped grow you into where you are today, in a way. And it'd be great to know who those influential people are were that have helped you to get to where you are today so if you do you have like an idea of who those people are yeah yeah um so the first one is my father and you Mm. know that might sound a bit cliched but the reality was that he he gave me two things number one he was an engineer he's the reason why i ended up being an engineer i didn't want to be a dirty hands filthy engineer like him Mm. i wanted to be a design engineer i never became a design engineer if anything i became an even dirtier handed engineer by working in the environments that I did because he was a tool maker and I ended up digging acid sludge out of tanks and things like that. Um, but his 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 ability to problem solve and his way of thinking and how calm he was around things and seeing him build all this stuff was what inspired me to become an engineer in the first place. But he also supported me in, in lots of other ways. Number one, he bought me my first computer when I was seven which is now 40 years ago, just to give an indication of how old I am and and the age of computer I started on. Um, Partly because he was interested, no matter what he said, just said, oh, it's for your education. So no, he was was just as geeky and interested in it as me. But also his, his biggest philosophy in life was, so long as you're working hard to get where you want to go to, son, I will help you and I will support you. So he never said I couldn't do anything, but if I, I, I couldn't do nothing. So he, he always, you know, drove me forward on that. So he was and still is very inspirational for me and definitely was a very, very good mentor and, and, and always been there for me. And on that switch, when I, when I changed roles, my, my first business I worked for was uh, the Greater London Authority who looks at basically that's the 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 organization that supports the mayor of london and delivering what the mayor wants um and i came in on a 14-day work placement to fix um, an access database they had and said you can't this is impossible i will patch it but you need to rebuild it i never really left because i got a year's placement there because i was doing my uni degree and and then Mm -hmm. just stayed and there was a manager there, uh, Jawaid Batty. He's 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 left there. He, he worked for the Labour Party for a bit. He decided to retire and go around the world just as COVID hits. So I, I don't I don't know what he's doing at the moment, but he helped me grow up mm-hmm. in the industry. I think is the best way to describe it. He calmed me down, steadied me, 
And he's still there as somebody I reach out to as a mentor if I if I need occasional guidance. He's he's one of these people. He is the polar opposite me. He's had a plan. He's always had a plan. He's always working towards the plan. And there's the immediate plan. There's the two year plan. There's the five year goal. And I'm just like, I got up in the morning, way plan complete kind of thing. Uh, but he's been very good and he's very steadying and has been very very steadying on me. And there's a few few other people, uh, professional people who work for very large kind of maybe cloud provider organizations who I consider a mentor now and you know, give them a call and ask them because of the job I took now, basically. Um, but there's also one other guy. We, we, we talked earlier about the fact that how the recruitment industry has changed. So there's one guy called Kyle who is a recruiter, just started up his own business i won't advertise because you know don't want to go on the same same business elsewhere um but he's actually been very good uh yeah. simply because he he wants that human element he wants the human contact he he understands he placed me many moons ago and has placed me many times since because he understands my current situation he doesn't understand it but he has empathy for my current situation and he's very good because he will always give you time. You reach out to him and he'll try and book you in so we can have conversations about what's the market like? What should I be doing? Is this path right? Is this path wrong? And and, and I find him, he's, he's been very, very helpful for me to get where I am, both through placing me in the correct organizations that have suited me at the time, so I've grown through those organizations. Uh, his, his, his last placement was the one that, made me the, the the people manager and put me in a position luckily with a team that helped me grow there mm-hmm. and he placed me in the previous role which was great because that was the start of down the path of realizing that maybe I had to grow up myself and take responsibility rather than just hiding as an engineer so you know it, it's that overall from my father Jawade in the middle who steadied me down that meant I focused more on my career rather than the partying bit that I spoke about earlier because I was very much enjoying life uh, at that age. And then Kyle, who's been there kind of helping me work out what my next step is in terms of what's out there at the moment is now the right time to jump and all of that kind of stuff. So they're still there. They're still influencing me, sometimes good sometimes bad you never know as well that's the thing with 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 people who are around you that that support you and help you go to where you need to be next and what what that looks like for for yourself and what that looks like to them it's advice is an amazing thing because you can listen to it you don't necessarily you can take the bits that you like of the advice but not necessarily the the whole cake and that's the that's the really brilliant thing about about mentors, isn't it? Yeah, and I think those three, and, and like I say, the, the, a couple of the others that I've got, all of them are very good because none of them have given me the answer. I ask them a question and they'll come back with a question. And it's all about just pushing me down that road, making me think, giving me the kick forward without ever going, I think you should do this. It's always a case of, so if you do that, what happens? And, and that, to me, I think is, means that I've only got myself to blame if things go wrong, mm-hmm. but they would never say that. And, and it's something that I've learned over life is that nothing is a failure. It's just a step in, 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 in the right direction to where you, you're going. And you know that's not the right direction. You need to turn right now instead of left. So on. Absolutely. Absolutely. And with with all the advice uh, that you've had and all those three individuals who have helped you throughout everything today, where you are and how they've helped you grow and change, is there any advice from what you've learned from them and and both just through your experiences that you the advice that you give yourself, say at the beginning of your career? I think the one thing I would have given myself at the beginning of my career is to save more money because then you don't get yourself trapped particularly in the IT industry, it pays very, very well. Um, but have, don't worry, it'll be fine. You'll get there. And, and 
that has come from the ethos of, I've been very fortunate, all of them have said, you know, you're a grafter, you will make it. And I think so long as you've got that ethos of working hard, then even if you make the most insane, fundamentally wrong decision, of which it's come close to that with me a few times, the reality is that my ability to apply myself and keep working mm -hmm. means that it's never really that fundamentally bad it's just a little pain that you have to work around to move yourself forward again and in in those because it's actually going to be a curveball question here because it's because it, everything will be fine everything works itself out everything's temporary isn't it it's that's the that's the one reality that i think we all seem to come to terms with eventually everyone comes to terms with it at different times and we all go through different challenges, like challenges me and you respectively faced a year ago is very different to what we're talking about today. And in those moments of challenge and struggle, particularly the last 18 months, we've all gone through different realizations, I'd like to think. Uh, is there anything that really sticks out to you um, from a um, challenging standpoint that you've personally experienced that you would like to echo to someone else or you know someone who's going through something challenging right now it will end mm. it comes you know and and not in a bad way it, it, mm. it's nothing is permanent in this world and no matter how bad things seem at this mm. moment in time just look for that one thing that is a movement in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be amazing. It doesn't have to be an instant fix. It doesn't, and it shouldn't, and it won't be a quick fix. But it is that one minor step forward. And even if that's wrong, and this comes back to the, there's no such thing as a failure. There's just a realizing that's not the correct way, that it's movement. And so long as you're moving, things are going to change. Absolutely. Never stagnant. And to my last question, and it's, it's very similar to, to what that, it probably will link to one bit of advice that I'm going to ask. And it comes from Richard Reed's book, uh, if I could tell you one thing. So if you could tell me one thing, Reese, what would it be? Ooh, never stop learning. Never stop learning. Definitely that. Mm. That is the key to life and it ties back in with all of the things i think i've said that if you're learning you're moving you're changing you can direct your path it, you you know you don't need to know everything because you're always still learning and stuff like that and i think as soon as you stop learning reality is you know you you've you've stagnated yeah it's so true learning if you're not learning and developing it's such a important part of everything we do every day it's uh, it's if you're if you're sat there going you know what this isn't for me this is so i need something else to evolve me and change change my perception of the way i'm doing it it really can affect everything can't it definitely definitely you know with without something to keep you moving forward and you even might be happy in your life but the reality is with everything around you you know we're looking back again everything around you changing you need to, to at least try and keep up with mm -hmm. with what's happening and that doesn't mean looking at the news i would say avoid the news i've worked for a media agency and i would suggest that maybe what we see in the news is not really what's happening in the vast majority of the world but you know you, you the world is moving forward. At least do something that helps you move forward with it. Absolutely. Yeah. And no, I just like to say, Reese, thank you so much for joining me on this week's episode. Um, really, really insightful. And it's really interesting to see your take on how you approach everything you do every single day. And um, guys, yeah, thank you so much for listening and taking the time. So it's all the reasons why Reese does the job he does every single day. But I'm um, looking forward to speaking to you all next week. Reese, thank you again. And I will thank speak you very much. Very soon. Take care.